and you are good for others too. Husband or wife or son or daughter. This is Zazen. Nirvana, the waterfall. If you go to Japan and visit a Haiji monastery, just before you enter you will see a small bridge called Hanshaku Kyo, which means half dipper bridge. Whenever Dogen Zenji dipped water from the river, he used only half a dipperful, returning the rest to the river again without throwing it away. That is why we call the bridge Hanshaku Kyo, half dipper bridge. At Eheiji, when we wash our face, we fill the basin to just 70% of its capacity. And after we wash, we empty the water towards rather than away from our body. This expresses respect for the water. This kind of practice is not based on any idea of being economical. It may be difficult to understand why Dogen returned half of the water he dipped to the river. This kind of practice is beyond our thinking. When we feel the beauty of the river, when we are one with the water, we intuitively do it in Dogen's way. It is our true nature to do so. But if your true nature is covered by ideas of economy or efficiency, Dogen's way makes no sense. I went to Yosemite National Park and I saw some huge waterfalls. The highest one there is 1,340 feet high and from it the water comes down like a curtain thrown from the top of the mountain. It does not seem to come down swiftly as you might expect. It seems to come down very slowly because of the distance. And the water does not come down as one stream, but is separated into many tiny streams. From a distance it looks like a curtain. And I thought it must be a very difficult experience for each drop of water to come down from the top of such a high mountain. It takes time, you know, a long time for the water finally to reach the bottom of the waterfall. And it seems to me that our human life may be like this. We have many difficult experiences in our life. But at the same time, I thought, the water was not originally separated, but was one whole river. Only when it is separated does it have some difficulty in falling. It is as if the water does not have any feeling when it is one whole river. Only when separated into many drops can it begin to have or to express some feeling. When we see one whole river, we do not feel the living activity of the water. But when we dip a part of the water into a dipper, we experience some feeling of the water, and we also feel the value of the person who uses the water. Feeling ourselves and the water in this way, we cannot use it in just a material way. It is a living thing. Before we were born, we had no feeling. We were one with the universe. This is called mind only, or essence of mind, or big mind. After we are separated by birth from this oneness, as the water falling from the waterfall is separated by the wind and rocks, then we have feeling. You have difficulty because you have feeling. You attach to the feeling you have without knowing just how this kind of feeling is created. When you do not realize that you are one with the river, or one with the universe, you have fear. Whether it is separated into drops or not, water is water. Our life and death are the same thing. When we realize this fact, we have no fear of death anymore, and we have no actual difficulty in our life. When the water returns to its original oneness with the river, it no longer has any individual feeling to it. It resumes its own nature and finds composure. How very glad the water must be to come back to the original river. If this is so, what feeling will we have when we die? And when we repeat, I create, I create, I create, soon we forget who is actually the I which creates the various things. We soon forget about God. This is the danger of human culture. Actually, to create with the big I is to give. We cannot create and own what we create for ourselves since everything was created by God. This point should not be forgotten. 
but because we do forget who is doing the creating and the reason for the creation, we become attached to the material or exchange value. This has no value in comparison to the absolute value of something as God's creation. Even though something has no material or relative value to any small I, it has absolute value in itself. Not to be attached to something is to be aware of its absolute value. Everything you do should be based on such an awareness and not on material or self-centered ideas of value. Then whatever you do is true giving, is Danya Prajna Paramita. When we sit in the cross-legged posture, we resume our fundamental activity of creation. There are perhaps three kinds of creation. The first is to be aware of ourselves after we finish Sazen. When we sit, we are nothing. We do not even realize what we are, we just sit. But when we stand up, we are there. That is the first step in creation. When you are there, everything else is there. Everything is created all at once. When we emerge from nothing, when everything emerges from nothing, we see it all as fresh, new creation. This is non-attachment. The second kind of creation is when you act or produce or prepare something like food or tea. The third kind is to create something within yourself, such as education or culture or art or some system for our society. So there are three kinds of creation. But if you forget the first, the most important one, the other two will be like children who have lost their parents. Their creation will mean nothing. Usually everyone forgets about Zazen. Everyone forgets about God. They work very hard at the second and third kinds of creation, but God does not help the activity. How is it possible for Him to help when He does not realize who He is? That is why we have so many problems in this world. When we forget the fundamental source of our creating, we are like children who do not know what to do when they lose their parents. If you understand Danya Prajna Paramita, you will understand how it is we create so many problems for ourselves. Of course, to live is to create problems. If we did not appear in this world, our parents would have no difficulty with us. Just by appearing, we create problems for them. This is all right. Everything creates some problems. But usually people think that when they die, everything is over. The problems disappear. But your death may create problems too. Actually, our problems should be solved or dissolved in this life. But if we are aware that what we do or what we create is really the gift of the big I, then we will not be attached to it and we will not create problems for ourselves or for others. And we should forget day by day what we have done. This is true non-attachment and we should do something new. To do something new, of course we must know our past, and this is all right. But we should not keep holding on to anything we have done. We should only reflect on it. And we must have some idea of what we should do in the future. But the future is the future. The past is the past. Now we should work on something new. This is our attitude and how we should live in this world. This is Danya Prajna Paramita, to give something or to create something for ourselves. So to do something through and through is to resume our true activity of creation. This is why we sit. If we do not forget this point, everything will be carried on beautifully. But once we forget this point, the world will be filled with confusion. Mistakes in practice. There are several poor ways of practice which you should understand. Usually when you practice Zazen, you become very idealistic and you set up an ideal or goal which you strive to attain and fulfill. But as I have often said, this is absurd. When you are idealistic, you have some gaining idea within yourself. By the time you attain your ideal or goal, your gaining idea will create another ideal. So as long as your practice is based on a gaining idea and you practice Zazen in an idealistic way, you will have no time actually to attain your ideal. 
Moreover, you will be sacrificing the meat of your practice. Because your attainment is always ahead, you will always be sacrificing yourself now for some ideal in the future. You end up with nothing. This is absurd. It is not adequate practice at all. But even worse than this idealistic attitude is to practice Zazen in competition with someone else. This is a poor, shabby kind of practice. Our Soto way puts an emphasis on shikantaza, or just sitting. Actually, we do not have any particular name for our practice. When we practice Zazen, we just practice it. And whether we find joy in our practice or not, we just do it. Even though we are sleepy and we are tired of practicing Zazen, of repeating the same thing day after day, even so, we continue our practice. Whether or not someone encourages our practice, we just do it. Even when you practice Zazen alone without a teacher, I think you will find some way to tell whether your practice is adequate or not. When you are tired of sitting, or when you are disgusted with your practice, you should recognize this as a warning signal. You become discouraged with your practice when your practice has been idealistic. You have some gaining idea in your practice and it is not pure enough. It is when your practice is rather greedy that you become discouraged with it. So you should be grateful that you have a sign or warning signal to show you the weak point in your practice. At that time, forgetting all about your mistake and renewing your way, you can resume your original practice. This is a very important point. So as long as you continue your practice, you are quite safe. But as it is very difficult to continue, you must find some way to encourage yourself. As it is hard to encourage yourself without becoming involved in some poor kind of practice, to continue our pure practice by yourself may be rather difficult. This is why we have a teacher. With your teacher you will correct your practice. Of course you will have a very hard time with him, but even so you will always be safe from wrong practice. Most Zen Buddhist priests have had a difficult time with their masters. When they talk about the difficulties, you may think that without this kind of hardship you cannot practice Zazen, but this is not true. Study yourself. The purpose of studying Buddhism is not to study Buddhism, but to study ourselves. It is impossible to study ourselves without some teaching. If you want to know what water is, you need science and the scientist needs a laboratory. In the laboratory there are various ways in which to study what water is. Thus it is possible to know what kind of elements water has, the various forms it takes, and its nature. But it is impossible thereby to know water in itself. It is the same thing with us. We need some teaching, but just by studying the teaching alone, it is impossible to know what I in myself am. Through the teaching we may understand our human nature, but the teaching is not we ourselves, it is some explanation of ourselves. So if you are attached to the teaching, or to the teacher, that is a big mistake. The moment you meet a teacher, you should leave the teacher, and you should be independent. You need a teacher so that you can become independent. If you are not attached to him, the teacher will show you the way to yourself. You have a teacher for yourself, not for the teacher. Rinzai, an early Chinese Zen master, analyzed how to teach his disciples in four ways. Sometimes he talked about the disciple himself. Sometimes he talked about the teaching itself. Sometimes he gave an interpretation of the disciple or the teaching. And finally, sometimes he did not give any instruction at all to his disciples. He knew that even without being given any instruction, a student is a student. Strictly speaking, there is no need to teach the student, because the student himself is Buddha, even though he may not be aware of it. And even though he is aware of his true nature, if he is attached to this awareness, that is already wrong. When he is not aware of it, he has everything. But when he becomes aware of it, he thinks that what he is aware of is himself, which is a big mistake. 
when you do not hear anything from the teacher but just sit. This is called teaching without teaching. But sometimes this is not sufficient. So we listen to lectures and have discussions. But we should remember that the purpose of practice in a particular place is to study ourselves. To be independent, we study. Like the scientist, we have to have some means by which to study. We need a teacher because it is impossible to study ourselves by ourselves. But you should not make a mistake. You should not take what you have learned with a teacher for you yourself. The study you make with your teacher is a part of your everyday life, a part of your incessant activity. In this sense, there is no difference between the practice and the activity you have in everyday life. So to find the meaning of your life in the Zendo is to find the meaning of your everyday activity. To be aware of the meaning of your life, you practice Sazen. When I was at a Heiji monastery in Japan, everyone was just doing what he should do. That is all. It is the same as waking up in the morning. We have to get up. At a Heiji monastery, when we had to sit, we sat. When we had to bow to Buddha, we bowed to Buddha. That is all. And when we were practicing, we did not feel anything special. We did not even feel that we were leading a monastic life. For us, the monastic life was the usual life. And people who came from the city were unusual people. When we saw them, we felt, oh, some unusual people have come. But once I had left Eheji and been away for some time, coming back was different. I heard the various sounds of practice, the bells and the monks reciting the sutra, and I had a deep feeling. There were tears flowing out of my eyes, nose, and mouth. It is the people who are outside of the monastery who feel its atmosphere. Those who are practicing actually do not feel anything. I think this is true for everything. When we hear the sound of the pine trees on a windy day, perhaps the wind is just blowing and the pine tree is just standing in the wind. That is all that they are doing. But the people who listen to the wind in the tree will write a poem or will feel something unusual. That is, I think, the way everything is. So to feel something about Buddhism is not the main point. Whether that feeling is good or bad is out of the question. We do not mind whatever it is. Buddhism is not good or bad. We are doing what we should do. That is Buddhism. Of course, some encouragement is necessary, but that encouragement is just encouragement. It is not the true purpose of practice. It is just medicine. When we become discouraged, we want some medicine. When we're in good spirits, we don't need any medicine. You should not mistake medicine for food. Sometimes medicine is necessary, but it should not become our food. So of Rinzai's four ways of practice, the perfect one is not to give a student any interpretation of himself, nor to give him any encouragement. If we think of ourselves as our bodies, the teaching then may be our clothing. Sometimes we talk about our clothing. Sometimes we talk about our body but neither body nor clothing is actually we ourselves. We ourselves are the big activity. We are just expressing the smallest particle of the big activity, that is all. So it is all right to talk about ourselves, but actually there is no need to do so. Before we open our mouths, we are already expressing the big existence, including ourselves. So the purpose of talking about ourselves is to correct the misunderstanding we have when we are attached to any particular temporal form or color of the big activity. It is necessary to talk about what our body is and what our activity is so that we may not make any mistake about them. So to talk about ourselves is actually to forget about ourselves. Dogen Zenji said, to study Buddhism is to study ourselves. To study ourselves is to forget ourselves. When you become attached to a temporal expression of your true nature, it is necessary to talk about Buddhism or else you will think the temporal expression is it. But this particular expression of it is not it. And yet at the same time it is it. For a while this is it. For the smallest particle of time this is it. But it is not always so. The very next instant it is not so. 
and thus this is not it. So that you will realize this fact, it's necessary to study Buddhism. But the purpose of studying Buddhism is to study ourselves and to forget ourselves. When we forget ourselves, we actually are the true activity of the big existence, or reality itself. When we realize this fact, there's no problem whatsoever in this world and we can enjoy our life without feeling any difficulties. The purpose of our practice is to be aware of this fact. To polish a tile. In the midst of noise and change, your mind will be quiet and stable. Zen is not something to get excited about. Some people start to practice Zen just out of curiosity, and they only make themselves busier. If your practice makes you worse, it is ridiculous. I think that if you try to do Zazen once a week, that will make you busy enough. Do not be too interested in Zen. When young people get excited about Zen, they often give up schooling and go to some mountain or forest in order to sit. That kind of interest is not true interest. Just continue in your calm, ordinary practice and your character will be built up. If your mind is always busy, there will be no time to build and you will not be successful, particularly if you work too hard on it. Building character is like making bread. You have to mix it, little by little, step by step, and moderate temperature is needed. You know yourself quite well, and you know how much temperature you need. You know exactly what you need. But if you get too excited, you will forget how much temperature is good for you, and you will lose your own way. This is very dangerous. Buddha said the same thing about the good ox driver. The driver knows how much load the ox can carry, and he keeps the ox from being overloaded. You know your way and your state of mind. Do not carry too much. Buddha also said that building character is like building a dam. You should be very careful in making the bank. If you try to do it all at once, water will leak from it. Make the bank carefully and you'll end up with a fine dam for the reservoir. Our unexciting way of practice may appear to be very negative. This is not so. It is a wise and effective way to work on ourselves. It is just very plain. I find this point very difficult for people, especially young people, to understand. On the other hand, it may seem as if I am speaking about gradual attainment. This is not so either. In fact, this is the sudden way, because when your practice is calm and ordinary, everyday life itself is enlightenment, right effort. The most important point in our practice is to have right or perfect effort. Right effort directed in the right direction is necessary. If your effort is headed in the wrong direction, especially if you're not aware of this, it is deluded effort. Our effort in our practice should be directed from achievement to non-achievement. Usually when you do something, you want to achieve something. You attach to some result. From achievement to non-achievement means to be rid of the unnecessary and bad results of effort. If you do something in the spirit of non-achievement, there's a good quality in it. So just to do something without any particular effort is enough. When you make some special effort to achieve something, some excessive quality, some extra element is involved in it. You should get rid of excessive things. If your practice is good, Without being aware of it, you will become proud of your practice. That pride is extra. What you do is good, but something more is added to it, so you should get rid of that something which is extra. This point is very, very important, but usually we are not subtle enough to realize it, and we go in the wrong direction. Because all of us are doing the same thing and making the same mistake, we do not realize it. So without realizing it, we are making many mistakes, and we create problems among us. This kind of bad effort is called being dharma-ridden or practice-ridden. You are involved in some idea of practice or attainment, and you cannot get out of it. 
When you are involved in some dualistic idea, it means your practice is not pure. By purity, we do not mean to polish something, trying to make some impure thing pure. By purity, we just mean things as they are. When something is added, that is impure. When something becomes dualistic, that is not pure. If you think you will get something from practicing Zazen, already you are involved in impure practice. It is all right to say there is practice and there is enlightenment, but we should not be caught by the statement. You should not be tainted by it. When you practice Zazen, just practice Zazen. If enlightenment comes, it just comes. We should not attach to the attainment. The true quality of Zazen is always there even if you're not aware of it. So forget all about what you think you may have gained from it. Just do it. The quality of Zazen will express itself. Then you will have it. People ask what it means to practice Zazen with no gaining idea. What kind of effort is necessary for that kind of practice? The answer is effort to get rid of something extra from our practice. If some extra idea comes, you should try to stop it. You should remain in pure practice. That's the point toward which our effort is directed. We say, to hear the sound of one hand clapping. Usually the sound of clapping is made with two hands, and we think that clapping with one hand makes no sound at all. But actually, one hand is sound. Even though you do not hear it, there is sound. If you clap with two hands, you can hear the sound. But if sound did not already exist before you clapped, you could not make the sound. Before you make it, there is sound. Because there is sound, you can make it, and you can hear it. Sound is everywhere. Whether you have difficulties in your practice or not, as long as you continue it, you have pure practice in its true sense. Even when you are not aware of it, you have it. So Dogen Zenji said, do not think you will necessarily be aware of your own enlightenment. Whether or not you are aware of it, you have your own true enlightenment within your practice. Another mistake will be to practice for the sake of the joy you find in it. Actually, when your practice is involved in a feeling of joy, it is not in very good shape either. Of course, this is not poor practice, but compared to the true practice, it is not so good. In Hinayana Buddhism, practice is classified in four ways. The best way is just to do it without having any joy in it, not even spiritual joy. This way is just to do it, forgetting your physical and mental feeling, forgetting all about yourself and your practice. This is the fourth stage or the highest stage. The next highest stage is to have just physical joy in your practice. At this stage, you find some pleasure in practice and you will practice because of the pleasure you find in it. In the second stage, you have both mental and physical joy or good feeling. These two middle stages are stages in which you practice Zazen because you feel good in your practice. The first stage is when you have no thinking and no curiosity in your practice. These four stages also apply to our Mahayana practice, and the highest is just to practice it. If you find some difficulty in your practice, that is the warning that you have some wrong idea, so you have to be careful. But do not give up your practice. Continue it knowing your weakness. Here there is no gaining idea. Here there is no fixed idea of attainment. You do not say, this is enlightenment, or that is not right practice. Even in wrong practice, when you realize it and continue, there is right practice. Our practice cannot be perfect, but without being discouraged by this, we should continue it. This is the secret of practice. And if you want to find some encouragement in your discouragement, getting tired of practice is itself the encouragement. You encourage yourself when you get tired of it. When you do not want to do it, that is the warning signal. It is like having a toothache when your teeth are not so good. When you feel some pain in your teeth, you go to a dentist. That is our way. 
The cause of conflict is some fixed idea or one-sided idea. When everyone knows the value of pure practice, we will have little conflict in our world. This is the secret of our practice and Dogen Zenji's way. Dogen repeats this point in his book, Shobogenzo, The Treasury of the True Dharma. If you understand the cause of conflict as some fixed or one-sided idea, you can find meaning in various practices without being caught by any of them. If you do not realize this point, you will be easily caught by some particular way and you will say, this is enlightenment, this is perfect practice, this is our way, the rest of the ways are not perfect, this is the best way. This is a big mistake. There is no particular way in true practice. You should find your own way and you should know what kind of practice you have right now. Knowing both the advantages and disadvantages of some special practice, you can practice that special way without danger. But if you have a one-sided attitude, you will ignore the disadvantage of the practice emphasizing only its good part. Eventually you will discover the worst side of the practice and become discouraged when it is too late. This is silly. We should be grateful that the ancient teachers point out this mistake. Limiting your activity. In our practice we have no particular purpose or goal, nor any special object of worship. In this respect our practice is somewhat different from the usual religious practices. Joshu, a great Chinese Zen master said, a clay Buddha cannot cross water, a bronze Buddha cannot get through a furnace, a wooden Buddha cannot get through a fire. Whatever it is, if your practice is directed towards some particular object, such as a clay, a bronze, or a wooden Buddha, it will not always work. So as long as you have some particular goal in your practice, that practice will not help you completely. It may help you as long as you're directed toward that goal, but when you resume your everyday life, it will not work. You may think that if there is no purpose or no goal in our practice, we will not know what to do. But there is a way. The way to practice without having any goal is to limit your activity or to be concentrated on what you are doing in this moment. Instead of having some particular object in mind, you should limit your activity. When your mind is wandering about elsewhere, you have no chance to express yourself. But if you limit your activity to what you can do just now, in this moment, then you can express fully your true nature, which is the universal Buddha nature. This is our way. When we practice Sazen, we limit our activity to the smallest extent. Just keeping the right posture and being concentrated on sitting is how we express the universal nature. Then we become Buddha, and we express Buddha nature. So instead of having some object of worship, we just concentrate on the activity which we do in each moment. When you bow, you should just bow. When you sit, you should just sit. When you eat, you should just eat. If you do this, the universal nature is there. In Japanese, we call it Ichigyo Zamai, or One Act Samadhi. Samai, or Samadhi, is concentration. Ichigyo, is one practice. I think some of you who practice Zazen here may believe in some other religion, but I do not mind. Our practice has nothing to do with some particular religious belief, and for you there is no need to hesitate to practice our way, because it has nothing to do with Christianity, or Shintoism, or Hinduism. Our practice is for everyone. Usually when someone believes in a particular religion, his attitude becomes more and more a sharp angle, pointing away from himself. But our way is not like this. In our way, the point of the sharp angle is always toward ourselves, not away from ourselves. So there is no need to worry about the difference between Buddhism and the religion you may believe in. Joshua's statement about the different Buddhas concerns those who direct their practice toward some particular Buddha. One kind of Buddha will not serve your purpose completely. You will have to throw it away sometime, or at least ignore it. But if you understand the secret of our practice, wherever you go, 
you yourself are boss. No matter what the situation, you cannot neglect Buddha because you yourself are Buddha. Only this Buddha will help you completely. Our way is to put the dough in the oven and watch it carefully. Once you know how the dough becomes bread, you will understand enlightenment. So how this physical body becomes a sage is our main interest. We are not so concerned about what flour is, or what dough is, or what a sage is. A sage is a sage. Metaphysical explanations of human nature are not the point. So the kind of practice we stress thus cannot become too idealistic. If an artist becomes too idealistic, he will commit suicide, because between his ideal and his actual ability, there is a great gap. Because there is no bridge long enough to go across the gap, he will begin to despair. That is the usual spiritual way. But our spiritual way is not so idealistic. In some sense, we should be idealistic. At least we should be interested in making bread which tastes and looks good. Actual practice is repeating over and over again until you find out how to become bread. There is no secret in our way. Just to practice Zazen and put ourselves into the oven is our way. Zen and Excitement My master died when I was 31. Although I wanted to devote myself just to Zen practice at a Heiji monastery, I had to succeed my master at his temple. I became quite busy, and being so young I had many difficulties. These difficulties gave me some experience, but it meant nothing compared with the true, calm, serene way of life. It is necessary for us to keep the constant way. Zen is not some kind of excitement, but concentration on our usual, everyday routine. If you become too busy and too excited, your mind becomes rough and ragged. This is not good. If possible, try to be always calm and joyful and keep yourself from excitement. Usually, we become busier and busier, day by day, year by year, especially in our modern world. If we revisit old, familiar places after a long time, we are astonished by the changes. It cannot be helped. But if we become interested in some excitement or in our own change, we will become completely involved in our busy life and we will be lost. But if your mind is calm and constant, you can keep yourself away from the noisy world, even though you are in the midst of it. Zen stories or koans are very difficult to understand before you know what we are doing moment after moment. But if you know exactly what we are doing in each moment, you will not find koans so difficult. There are so many koans. I have often talked to you about a frog, and each time everybody laughs. But a frog is very interesting. He sits like us too, you know. But he does not think that he's doing anything so special. When you go to a zendo and sit, you may think you are doing some special thing. While your husband or wife is sleeping, you are practicing sazen. You are doing some special thing and your spouse is lazy. That may be your understanding of zazen. But look at the frog. A frog also sits like us, but he has no idea of zazen. Watch him. If something annoys him, he will make a face. If something comes along to eat, he will snap it up and eat, and he eats sitting. Actually, that is our zazen, not any special thing. Here is a kind of frog koan for you. Basso was a famous Zen master called the Horse Master. He was the disciple of Nangaku, one of the sixth patriarch's disciples. One day while he was studying under Nangaku, Basso was sitting practicing zazen. He was a man of large physical build. When he talked, his tongue reached to his nose. His voice was loud and his zazen must have been very good. Nangaku saw him sitting like a great mountain or like a frog. Nangaku asked, What are you doing? I am practicing zazen, Basso replied. Why are you practicing zazen? I want to attain enlightenment. I want to be a Buddha, the disciple said. Do you know what the teacher did? He picked up a tile and he started to polish it. 
In Japan, after taking the tile from the kiln, we polish it to give it a beautiful finish. So Nangaku picked up a tile and started to polish it. Basso, his disciple, asked, What are you doing? I want to make this tile into a jewel, Nangaku said. How is it possible to make a tile a jewel, Basso asked. How is it possible to become a Buddha by practicing Zazen, Nangaku replied. Do you want to attain Buddhahood? There is no Buddhahood beside your ordinary mind. When a cart does not go, which do you whip, the cart or the horse? The master asked. Nangaku's meaning here is that whatever you do, that is Zazen. True Zazen is beyond being in bed or sitting in the Zendo. If your husband or wife is in bed, that is Zazen. If you think I'm sitting here and my spouse is in bed, then even though you are sitting here in the cross-legged position, that is not true Zazen. You should be like a frog always. That is true Zazen. Dogen Zenji commented on this koan. He said, when the horse master becomes the horse master, Zen becomes Zen. When Basso becomes Basso, his Zazen becomes true Zazen and Zen becomes Zen. What is true Zazen? When you become you. When you are you, then no matter what you do, that is Zazen. Even though you are in bed, you may not be you most of the time. Even though you are sitting in the Zendo, I wonder whether you are you in the true sense. Here's another famous koan. Zuikan was a Zen master who always used to address himself. Zuikan, he would call, and then he would answer, Yes? Zuikan? Yes. Of course, he was living all alone in his small Zendo, and of course he knew who he was. But sometimes he lost himself. And whenever he lost himself, he would address himself. Zuikan? Yes. If we are like a frog, we are always ourselves. But even a frog sometimes loses himself and he makes a sour face. And if something comes along, he will snap at it and eat it. So I think a frog is always addressing himself. I think you should do that also. Even in Zazen, you will lose yourself. When you become sleepy or when your mind starts to wander about, you lose yourself. When your legs become painful, why are my legs so painful? You lose yourself. Because you lose yourself, your problem will be a problem for you. If you do not lose yourself, then even though you have difficulty, there is actually no problem whatsoever. You just sit in the midst of the problem. When you are a part of the problem, or when the problem is a part of you, there is no problem, because you are the problem itself. The problem is you, yourself. If this is so, there's no problem. When your life is always a part of your surroundings, in other words, when you are called back to yourself in the present moment, then there is no problem. When you start to wander about in some delusion, which is something apart from you yourself, then your surroundings are not real anymore, and your mind is not real anymore. If you yourself are deluded, then your surroundings are also a misty, foggy delusion. Once you are in the midst of delusion, there is no end to delusion. You will be involved in deluded ideas one after another. Most people live in delusion, involved in their problem, trying to solve their problem. But just to live is actually to live in problems. And to solve the problem is to be a part of it, to be one with it. So which do you hit, the cart or the horse? Which do you hit, yourself or your problems? If you start questioning which you should hit, that means you have already started to wander about. But when you actually hit the horse, the cart will go. In truth, the cart and the horse are not different. When you are you, there is no problem of whether you should hit the cart or the horse. When you are you, Zazen becomes true Zazen. So when you practice Zazen, your problem will practice Zazen. And everything else will practice Zazen too, even though your spouse is in bed.
he or she is also practicing Zazen when you practice Zazen. But when you do not practice true Zazen, then there is your spouse and there is yourself, each quite different, quite separate from the other. So if you yourself have true practice, then everything else is practicing our way at the same time. That is why we should always address ourselves, checking up on ourselves like a doctor tapping himself. This is very important. This kind of practice should be continued moment after moment, incessantly. We say, when the night is here, the dawn comes. It means there is no gap between the dawn and the night. Before the summer is over, autumn comes. In this way, we should understand our life. We should practice with this understanding and solve our problems in this way. Actually, just to work on the problem, if you do it with single-minded effort, is enough. You should just polish the tile. That is our practice. The purpose of practice is not to make a tile a jewel. Just continue sitting. That is practice in its true sense. It is not a matter of whether or not it is possible to attain Buddhahood, whether or not it is possible to make a tile a jewel. Just to work and live in this world with this understanding is the most important point. That is our practice. That is true Zazen. So we say, when you eat, eat. You should eat what is there, you know. Sometimes you do not eat it. Even though you are eating, your mind is somewhere else. You do not taste what you have in your mouth. As long as you can eat when you are eating, you are all right. Do not worry a bit. It means you are you, yourself. When you are you, you see things as they are, and you become one with your surroundings. There is your true self. There you have true practice. You have the practice of a frog. He is a good example of our practice. When a frog becomes a frog, sin becomes sin. When you understand a frog through and through, you attain enlightenment. You are Buddha. This is an example of leaving a trace of one's thinking. We should not forget what we did, but it should be without an extra trace. To leave a trace is not the same as to remember something. It is necessary to remember what we have done, but we should not become attached to what we have done in some special sense. What we call attachment is just these traces of our thought and activity. In order not to leave any traces, when you do something, you should do it with your whole body and mind. You should be concentrated on what you do. You should do it completely like a good bonfire. You should not be a smoky fire. You should burn yourself completely. If you do not burn yourself completely, a trace of yourself will be left in what you do. You will have something remaining which is not completely burned out. Zen activity is activity which is completely burned out, with nothing remaining but ashes. This is the goal of our practice. That is what Dogen meant when he said, Ashes do not come back to firewood. Ash is ash. Ash should be completely ash. The firewood should be firewood. When this kind of activity takes place, one activity covers everything. So our practice is not a matter of one hour or two hours or one day or one year. If you practice Zazen with your whole body and mind, even for a moment, that is Zazen. So moment after moment, you should devote yourself to your practice. You should not have any remains after you do something. But this does not mean to forget all about it. If you understand this point, all the dualistic thinking and all the problems of life will vanish. When you practice Zen, you become one with Zen. There is no you and no Zazen. When you bow, there is no Buddha and no you. One complete bowing takes place, that is all. This is Nirvana. When Buddha transmitted our practice to Maha Kashyapa, he just picked up a flower with a smile. Only Maha Kashyapa understood what he meant. No one else understood. We do not know if this is a historical event or not, but it means something. 
it is a demonstration of our traditional way. Some activity which covers everything is true activity. And the secret of this activity is transmitted from Buddha to us. This is Zen practice, not some teaching taught by Buddha or some rules of life set up by him. The teaching or the rules should be changed according to the place or according to the people who observe them. But the secret of this practice cannot be changed. It is always true. So for us, there is no other way to live in this world. I think this is quite true. And this is easy to accept, easy to understand, and easy to practice. If you compare the kind of life based on this practice with what is happening in this world or in human society, you will find out just how valuable the truth Buddha left us is. It is quite simple, and practice is quite simple. But even so, we should not ignore it. Its great value must be discovered. Usually when it is so simple, we say, Oh, I know that. It is quite simple. Everyone knows that. But if we do not find its value, it means nothing. It is the same as not knowing. The more you understand culture, the more you will understand how true and how necessary this teaching is. Instead of only criticizing your culture, you should devote your mind and body to practicing this simple way. Then society and culture will grow out of you. It may be all right for the people who are too attached to their culture to be critical. Their critical attitude means they are coming back to the simple truth left by Buddha. But our approach is just to be concentrated on a simple, basic practice and a simple, basic understanding of life. There should be no traces in our activity. We should not attach to some fancy ideas or to some beautiful things. We should not seek for something good. The truth is always near at hand, within your reach. God giving. Every existence in nature, every existence in the human world, every cultural work that we create is something which was given or is being given to us, relatively speaking. But as everything is originally one, we are in actuality giving out everything. Moment after moment we are creating something, and this is the joy of our life. But this I which is creating and always giving out something, is not the small I, it is the big I. Even though you do not realize the oneness of this big I with everything, when you give something you feel good, because at that time you feel at one with what you are giving. This is why it feels better to give than to take. We have a saying, Danya Prajna Paramita. Danya means to give. Prajna is wisdom, and paramita means to cross over or to reach the other shore. Our life can be seen as a crossing of a river. The goal of our life's effort is to reach the other shore, nirvana. Prajna paramita, the true wisdom of life, is that in each step of the way, the other shore is actually reached. To reach the other shore with each step of the crossing is the way of true living. Danya Prajna Paramita is the first of the six ways of true living. The second is Sila Prajna Paramita, or the Buddhist precepts. Then there are Kshanti Prajna Paramita, or endurance, Virya Prajna Paramita, or ardor and constant effort, Dhyana Prajna Paramita, or Zen practice, and Prajna Paramita, or wisdom. Actually, these six Prajna Paramita are one, but as we can observe life from various sides, we count six. Dogen Zenji said, to give is non-attachment. That is, just not to attach to anything is to give. It does not matter what is given. To give a penny or a piece of leaf is Danya Prajna Paramita. To give one line or even one word of teaching is Danya Prajna Paramita. If given in the spirit of non-attachment, the material offering 
and the teaching offering have the same value. With the right spirit, all that we do, all that we create, is Danya Prajna Paramita. So Dogen said, to produce something, to participate in human activity, is also Danya Prajna Paramita. To provide a ferry boat for people, or to make a bridge for people, is Danya Prajna Paramita. Actually, to give one line of the teaching may be to make a ferry boat for someone. According to Christianity, every existence in nature is something which was created for or given to us by God. That is the perfect idea of giving. But if you think that God created man and that you are somehow separate from God, you are liable to think you have the ability to create something separate, something not given by Him. For instance, we create airplanes and highways. If you just practice it, there is sound. Do not try to listen to it. If you do not listen to it, the sound is all over. Because you try to hear it, sometimes there is sound and sometimes there is no sound. Do you understand? Even though you do not do anything, you have the quality of Zazen, always. But if you try to find it, if you try to see the quality, you have no quality. You are living in this world as one individual. But before you take the form of a human being, you are already there, always there. We are always here. Do you understand? You think before you were born, you were not here. But how is it possible for you to appear in this world when there is no you? Because you are already there, you can appear in the world. Also, it is not possible for something to vanish which does not exist. Because something is there, something can vanish. You may think that when you die, you disappear. You no longer exist. But even though you vanish, something which is existent cannot be non-existent. That is the magic. We ourselves cannot put any magic spells on this world. The world is its own magic. If we are looking at something, it can vanish from our sight. But if we do not try to see it, that something cannot vanish. Because you are watching it, it can disappear. But if no one is watching, how is it possible for anything to disappear? If someone is watching you, you can escape from him. But if no one is watching, you cannot escape from yourself. So try not to see something in particular. Try not to achieve anything special. You already have everything in your own pure quality. If you understand this ultimate fact, there is no fear. There may be some difficulty, of course, but there is no fear. If people have difficulty without being aware of the difficulty, that is true difficulty. They may appear very confident. They may think they are making a big effort in the right direction, but without knowing it, what they do comes out of fear. Something may vanish for them. But if your effort is in the right direction, then there is no fear of losing anything. Even if it is in the wrong direction, if you are aware of that, you will not be deluded. There is nothing to lose. There is only the constant, pure quality of right practice. No trace. When we practice Zazen, our mind is calm and quite simple. But usually our mind is very busy and complicated, and it is difficult to be concentrated on what we are doing. This is because before we act, we think. And this thinking leaves some trace. Our activity is shadowed by some preconceived idea. The thinking not only leaves some trace or shadow, but also gives us many other notions about other activities and things. These traces and notions make our minds very complicated. When we do something with a quite simple, clear mind, we have no notion or shadows, and our activity is strong and straightforward. But when we do something with a complicated mind, in relation to other things or people or society, our activity becomes very complex. 
Most people have a double or triple notion in one activity. There is a saying to catch two birds with one stone. That is what people usually try to do. Because they want to catch too many birds, they find it difficult to be concentrated on one activity, and they may end up not catching any birds at all. That kind of thinking always leaves its shadow on their activity. The shadow is not actually the thinking itself. Of course, it is often necessary to think or prepare before we act, but right thinking does not leave any shadow. Thinking which leaves traces comes out of your relative, confused mind. Relative mind is the mind which sets itself in relation to other things, thus limiting itself. It is this small mind which creates gaining ideas and leaves traces of itself. If you leave a trace of your thinking on your activity, you will be attached to the trace. For instance, you may say, this is what I have done. But actually, it is not so. In your recollection, you may say, I did such and such a thing in some certain way. But actually, that is never exactly what happened. When you think in this way, you limit the actual experience of what you have done. So if you attach to the idea of what you have done, you are involved in selfish ideas. Often we think what we have done is good, but it may not actually be so. When we become old, we are very often proud of what we have done. When others listen to someone proudly telling something which he has done, they will feel funny because they know his recollection is one-sided. They know that what he has told them is not exactly what he did. Moreover, if he is proud of what he did, that pride will create some problem for him. Repeating his recollections in this way, his personality will be twisted more and more until he becomes quite a disagreeable, stubborn fellow. I think we are like the water in the dipper. We will have composure then, perfect composure. It may be too perfect for us just now because we are so much attached to our own feeling, to our individual existence. For us just now, we have some fear of death but after we resume our true original nature, there is nirvana. That is why we say, to attain nirvana is to pass away. To pass away is not a very adequate expression. Perhaps to pass on, or to go on, or to join would be better. Will you try to find some better expression for death? When you find it, you will have quite a new interpretation of your life. It will be like my experience when I saw the water in the big waterfall. Imagine, it was 1,340 feet high. We say everything comes out of emptiness. One whole river or one whole mind is emptiness. When we reach this understanding, we find the true meaning of our life. When we reach this understanding, we can see the beauty of human life. Before we realize this fact, everything that we see is just delusion. Sometimes we overestimate the beauty. Sometimes we underestimate or ignore the beauty because our small mind is not in accord with reality. To talk about it in this way is quite easy, but to have the actual feeling is not so easy. But by your practice of Zazen, you can cultivate this feeling. When you can sit with your whole body and mind, and with the oneness of your mind and body under the control of the universal mind, you can easily attain this kind of right understanding. Your everyday life will be renewed without being attached to an old, erroneous interpretation of life. When you realize this fact, you will discover how meaningless your old interpretation was and how much useless effort you had been making. You will find the true meaning of life and even though you have difficulty falling upright from the top of the waterfall to the bottom of the mountain, you will enjoy your life. Part 3. Right Understanding Traditional Zen Spirit The most important things in our practice are our physical posture and our way of breathing. We are not so concerned about a deep understanding of Buddhism. As a philosophy, Buddhism is a very deep, wide, and firm system of thought. 
but Zen is not concerned about philosophical understanding. We emphasize practice. We should understand why our physical posture and breathing exercise are so important. Instead of having a deep understanding of the teaching, we need a strong confidence in our teaching, which says that originally we have Buddha nature. Our practice is based on this faith. Before Bodhidharma went to China, almost all the well-known stock words of Zen were in use. For instance, there was the term sudden enlightenment. Sudden enlightenment is not an adequate translation, but tentatively I will use the expression. Enlightenment comes all of a sudden to us. This is true enlightenment. Before Bodhidharma, people thought that after a long preparation, sudden enlightenment would come. Thus, Zen practice was a kind of training to gain enlightenment. Actually, many people today are practicing Zazen with this idea. But this is not the traditional understanding of Zen. The understanding passed down from Buddha to our time is that when you start Zazen, there is enlightenment, even without any preparation. Whether you practice Zazen or not, you have Buddha nature. Because you have it, there is enlightenment in your practice. The points we emphasize are not the stage we attain, but the strong confidence we have in our original nature and the sincerity of our practice. We should practice Zen with the same sincerity as Buddha. If originally we have Buddha nature, the reason we practice Zazen is that we must behave like Buddha. To transmit our way is to transmit our spirit from Buddha. So we have to harmonize our spirit, our physical posture, and our activity with the traditional way.